Hi, welcome everybody. How is everybody doing? Good? Great. Let's wait for my presentation to start. Cool, so I'm Rob, I'm one of the hardware engineers, and today we're going to talk about how Comma actually works. Um, click on working. It's on. Oh, there it is. It's a little slow. Can you go to the next slide, please? No. So, today we're here to answer the question, how can something like Comma exist? So, like, we support most of the cars uh, that have been shipped in the last five years, and, like, how does this actually work? Because if you think about it, like, we have all these different brands, uh, they all work slightly differently. You would think they would all have their, like different standards, but somehow we managed to uh, build a system with only a few engineers, which works on most of the cars that are sold in the last few years. So, how does a motor car actually work? I mean, probably most of you already know that most, uh, that most cars are now filled with a bunch of electronics. Uh, so we have a bunch of connectivity going on. We have the comfort system. We have the powertrain stuff, which like, runs the engine. Uh, we have an infotainment system, but most importantly, most modern cars also ship with uh, an ADA system. So what does ADA stand for? Oh. This clicker's not working great. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> top, yeah, I'm pressing the top one. It's not doing anything. Oh. One back. There you go. So an advanced driver assistance system. So this means this is a system that's built for safety and for comfort. So it has both lane keep assist, which keeps you inside of the lane if you're not paying attention. Probably doesn't work very well in your car. Uh, but it also has um, uh, stuff like ACC, uh, adaptive cruise control, to keep distance with the car in front of you. And what we really care about is that the system has control over the gas and the brakes. Uh, this is really important for us because that's obviously something we want to control. Cool. So how does this, this ADAS system look in most cars? So usually you have two systems uh, which do the ADAS, uh, which is the radar and you have the vision system. So those are used, uh, the radar system is, to, is used to measure the distance with the car in front of you and you also have the vision system to look at the lanes and, and give some more visual clues uh, into the system. These then send messages over to the actuators such as gas, brakes and steering, uh, which then uh, control your car. Cool, so if we look at this from like a, a, a topology perspective, we have all these different systems. Uh, so you usually have the ADAS camera and the radar, which we already talked about. You have brake systems, power steering, engine control sensors, diagnostic stuff, uh, there's infotainment, user interface, so all the buttons in your car. Like everything that's electrical in your car is connected over these bus systems. Uh, on most cars, these are actually divided up into three different buses. Um, keep pressing. Oh, it's the bottom one. I see now. <laughs> uh, so you have the powertrain bus, which is the most important one. So this runs all your engine control stuff. Uh, you have a body bus, which is a little bit less important. This runs like your infotainment system um, and all the other buttons in your car. And then there's one extra bus, which is a radar bus. Usually they separate this one out because it has a lot of data going on it. So we don't want to uh, have all that data on the other buses. So if you want to control the car, like where do we want to be? Well, first of all, we want to get the radar points, but we also want to, uh, see what the, the camera is actually sending. So, you have all these bus systems. But what's actually going on on these buses? Well, all these buses use a protocol that's called CAN bus. Uh, this is used in most cars, and it basically consists of these messages with, which have an identifier and uh, a data portion, and they get sent around the bus, uh, providing all the data to the other modules. Um, so this is, uh, for example, one of, the, one of the messages that goes around on the bus. So you can see there's two, two lines there. They go uh, out, uh, out to each other, which means this is a dominant bit, and you have recessive bits. And these then make up the identifying the data portion and some other stuff you don't really care about. So why do all the cars use CAN bus? I mean, this, this is kind of, a, kind of a wonder, right? Like you have all these cars, they're all made by different brands, and somehow they all ended up at the same kind of bus system. Well, it turns out that in 1996, when cars weren't very uh, electronically complex yet, they all, uh, they all were mandated to use uh, a diagnostic port, so which is called an OBD2 port. You guys probably have seen this already, like below your dashboard, there's a port which is used for diagnostics. 
Um, in the specification, like it mentions that you can use one of five buses, of which the most common one was CAN bus, and so all the car manufacturers just chose the CAN bus and just went with it. Um, now, cars weren't very complex back then, so we usually only had this one CAN bus going on, but after that, like, they, uh, they merged out, and when they built all the, all the electronic systems, they just went with what they already knew, and they just went with CAN bus. Cool, now we know how a car like, kind of works on the inside. Like, how do we actually take control over the car? So, controlling the car is basically three different steps. So first we have to connect to the CAN buses. Uh, after that we have to figure out which message is which, because they, don't, they just have an identifier, which is a number, and they have a data portion which just looks like random garbage. Um, and then after that we have to uh, intercept it and send better control messages. So, let's first look at how we connect to the CAN bus. So if you go back to this topology, like, like I already said, like we really care about the data on the radar bus and we, need to, uh, we care about the messages which the ADAS camera can send to the rest of the car. Uh, so the ADAS camera is in control of uh, joining the radar and the vision data and then providing all the ACC messages which control grass and brakes and then also the lane assist messages which can uh, put torque on the steering wheel to steer your car. So where do we want to tap off? We want to tap off. Back. There we go. So we want to top off at this point. Uh, this point is kind of ideal because it's right in the cabin. Like, uh, this ADAS camera is located behind the rearview mirror, so that's the ideal spot to tap off these buses. Uh, you don't have to mess around in the engine compartment or anything. You can just take this connector, take it out, and then mess with it there. So if we simplify this diagram, so we have the radar system, which sends messages to the camera, and then the camera system sends messages to the rest of the car. So what do we do? We just connect to the radar, we split apart the camera and, and the rest of the car, and then uh, use a scan to USB interface to actually talk to the car. Um, the scan to USB interface is called the Panda, and then the open pilot device is the part that runs all the application code, all the machine learning models, which actually then figures out which messages to send. Um, so to connect to the car, we used to make this thing called the giraffe. Uh, maybe some of you who've been around for a long time still remember the giraffe. Um, and we have the panda, if it ever comes up, there's the panda, this is the white panda, this is the first one we sold. And as you can see, this is basically just uh, an OBD2 port which has three CAN buses on it, and it has a USB connection to go to the open pilot device, uh, which we used to sell, which was the Eon. Uh, this is just a phone in a 3D printed case with a heatsink. Uh, it's pretty simple. Cool, so if we put this all together, it kind of looks like this. So it's it's not the cleanest setup, like a camera cover is gone, um, like giraffe is just bungling down there, there's the panda plugged in, you have this USB connection which is kind of flaky, uh, and then the device mounted to your windshield. It's all about is these, these giraffes. So we used to have basically like four types of giraffes, these are the main ones that we sold. So we had the Toyota one, um, which is common for all Toyotas, then we had the Honda Bosch one, which is for Honda cars, but then with um, a Bosch camera installed. And then we also had Honda harnesses for the NIDAC camera system. Now we actually have two versions because you can anybody spot the difference? Um, I mean, this connector is upside down on one of them. So if one day, like NIDAC decided it would be really funny to like flip the connector around, so we had to make another harness. <laughs> cool, so giraffes. So it's not a very clean install. You saw that in the picture. Uh, there's a bunch of switches on it. So if like an open pilot device is not connected, uh, the car buses will still be separated. So your car thinks the camera isn't there, the radar isn't there, so it throws all sorts of faults. Uh, there's also like a lot of variants, they're all very different. They're hard to manufacture because they're so different. And it's also terrible naming. Like who knows what you're talking about if you're talking about your giraffe. So giraffes are canceled. So then we went, uh, on 2019, we rethought this whole ecosystem and we came up with what's called the car harness. So car harness is a very clean install. You can put it all behind your camera cover. Uh, it has no switches anymore. So if you disconnect your device, uh, it actually has a relay inside, um, which uh, switches your buses back together. So if you unplug your open pilot device, your car will just, just think there's nothing, nothing happened and uh, everything will work great. Car is happy. So this whole system is very generic. Um, so we have like the cabling system, we have the stuff that plugs into the OBD port, which is generic for every car. We have the harness block, which we manufactured. This has the relay in it and the auto switching logic. And then there's one custom connector for every car, which is the car harness uh, connector. So this one's very easy to manufacture because most things are common and it's also a great naming scheme. Like everybody knows what you're talking about if you're talking about the harness.
Cool. So we have all these different car harness connectors because like at this time we support, I think, 134 different cars, uh, not only Toyota and, and Honda anymore. Uh, so we have all these different connectors. So we, we get all of these made. Uh, so we have two for Honda, which we already saw. We have the NIDAC one and the Bosch one. Like now that there's a harness connector, we can actually just flip it around and still fit. Um, we have the Toyota one, we have the Nissan one, which also has two. We have a VW one, we have an FCA one, a Subaru one. And then there's Hyundai. <laughs> <laughs> they apparently didn't think it was necessary to make a standard in the company. Like most of these actually use the same connector, but some of the like buses, they just like pretend it was funny to flip the, the high and the low pair. And it's like, okay, ship a car that way. So we connected to the car buses. This is already figured out. Now, how do we know which message is which? Because we have all, of, we have all these messages going on. As you can see, like uh, we did a log of all the messages on the CAN bus. This is a video of the actual drive, and you have all these messages going on. There's actually a lot more. There's a, there's a, a whole bunch of messages. And you all have this identifier, and then a bunch of random bytes, with like, which like change during the drive. So how do you figure out how to, uh, uh, what part is which? Well, this takes quite a bit of reverse engineering effort, um, which we built a tool for called Cabana. Uh, I think Drew's gonna do a lightning talk, and he's gonna talk a little bit more about how to use this. Uh, but as you can see, like you can label all this data, once you figure out which is which, and then we can actually see like, okay, this message uh, is actually for like wheel speeds. So you have the four different wheels of the car. Uh, so we, we figured that out. You can plot this value. So you can see it corresponds with the picture now where it's you know, like stationary for a while and suddenly you start moving and see all the wheel speeds of the car. Cool. Now we have all the messages figured out. Where do we actually store these definitions? Um, so what industry standard uh, for these definitions is called a DBC file, which is basically a definition file for every CAN message on the bus. So it's just this, this large text file which specifies, like, okay, okay, this identifier is called this message, uh, these bits and this message uh, say this. Um, now these aren't uh, available from any car manufacturers because they're all are like internal secrets. Um, so we created this project called OpenDBC which we host on GitHub, uh, which has all these reverse engineered DBC files for all the cars we support. So as you can see, this is the one for the Civic, which we were looking at before. So this is, for example, the wheel speed message we were looking at with all the four wheel speeds, and then also a checksum to make sure the message arrived correctly. Uh, so what's, what kind of messages go around on the bus? So you have sensor values, button states. So if you press a button, like a bit toggles. Uh, there's control messages going on saying like, okay, I want to accelerate by X amount of meters per second squared. Uh, there's stuff about like what shows up on your dashboard, so you can uh, throw uh, arrow messages on the dash. There's the radar points going on from the radar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we figured out which message is which and how to connect to the canvas. What's left? Well, we just need to figure out like which message to actually send. Like how do we figure out what a better message is to keep you inside of the lanes and not just like drive out of the lanes and then bounce back? So we actually want to stay in the middle of the lane. Well, for this, we need to look at OpenPilot without all the fluff. Um, so OpenPal is made up of these, all these services which talk to each other. Uh, each service has this one specific purpose. Um, we call them demons, so that's why every one, end, uh, every one of them ends with a D. So it's camera D, model D, sensor D, controls D, et cetera. Uh, so we have the camera D, which is responsible for sending camera frames to the model. Uh, and the model D just runs our AI models on them and uh, actually outputs the information we care about. So for example, we have camera frame with the model input overlaid. Um, then we have sensor D, which takes all the values uh, that the sensor outputs, and then uh, those get all sent to controls D. Controls D is this big blob of code. Um, it's most, mostly mathematics with like path planning and stuff, which we'll look into a little bit more. Uh, controls D then actually generates the car specific messages you want to send, which are then forwarded to the panda or can to USB interface, and then the panda sends them over to the car such that the car is, uh, is happy. That's our, oh, let's go back to one more. So that's our panda inside of the comma two. If you open up the case, that's what you'll see. So there's an STM microcontroller in here, which provides USB to the phone, and then it has this OBDC connector, which outputs the CAN buses back to the car. Uh, and then here's the harness connector installed in the car. So after that, we'll look a little bit into uh, what Control Z is doing. Uh, so Control Z basically exists of like three big layers. So the top layer is the general uh, longitudinal and lateral planning. So this basically means, okay, the mold outputs, we want to be on this path, but you're actually over here. Like what's the actual best plan to get on the path that the model wants you to be at? 
Uh, so this then gets output to the control loops, which are very generic, so they're all um, in SI units or in like meters and meters per second squared and stuff like this. Um, and they actually um, go from the path to like the curvature you want to be in, uh, and then the curvature gets, gets uh, converted into an angle, and then the angle gets into a control loop, which then provides how much torque you actually want to put on the wheel to get to that path. Uh, beneath all of this, which is all generic, there's all the car interfaces. So each uh, car make we support has its, has its own little interface which basically specifies, okay, like how do we want to send these messages, at what rate, how do we fill them in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What are the car specific limitations? Um, and on average, we managed to support 134 cars with only on average 45 lines of code per car. So this is really easy to maintain. Uh, we also don't really have to own all these cars because a lot of this code actually comes from the community. We only own, I think, six cars at Goma. Um, so a lot of this comes from community contribution, which is really nice. Okay, so now we figured out how to control a car, right? So the talk should be over. Well, no, there's a fourth thing. You have to make sure that it's actually safe. Because uh, obviously you don't want to be on a highway and then your wheels start, suddenly start spinning like this. Um, that's not a good thing. So how do we figure this out? Well, from the beginning, comma set out to be very safe. So um, we made this one text file explaining very concisely uh, what our safety model is. And this basically boils down to two points. Uh, so the first is that the driver always needs to be attentive and ready to take over at all times. So uh, comma 2 is a level 2 system, which means that it, it, it requires the driver to always be attentive. And if it messes up, that the driver needs to be able to take over. Uh, we do this by enforcing that if you, for example, press the brakes uh, or the gas, that open pilot disengages and you have full control over the car again. The second part uh, means that the vehicle shouldn't alter its trajectory too fast for uh, a human to take over. Um, so for example, if you're going fast on a highway, you don't want the car to swerve suddenly uh, and steer you off the road. Uh, this is enforced in uh, our Panda Safety Library. So the Panda Safety Library is this piece of code which runs on a Panda. It runs on an, on an STM32, which is uh, an SLB rated microcontroller. Uh, and this code is, is meant to be very simple. So it doesn't use a lot of uh, external libraries. It's very easy to reason about. And this basically has, uh, um, this basically enforces like for every message if it's safe to send this message or not. So if you're going on a highway and you want to suddenly steer very hard, the panda's not going to allow that. So if, even if like somebody messes with open pilot code and you introduce a bug or anything, the panda will not allow this message to be sent uh, to ensure that you're safe. So, Quick example. For example, on the Toyota, there's this acceleration message, which has ID number uh, 0x343. And it, in it, it has a 16-bit uh, signed value, which basically tells the car to accelerate or decelerate. Uh, it's divided by 1,000. So in, in the end, you get up uh, with the limit. You end up with the limits minus 32 and 32 meters per second squared. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you know that uh, 1G is like 9 meters per second squared, so this is quite a big range. So you don't want your car to suddenly slam on the brakes with 3 Gs of force. Uh, so the Panda enforces these limits. So we have a limit uh, between minus 3, which is pretty hard braking, and we have a limit of, of 1.5, which is pretty fast acceleration, but still within our safety model. So the Panda gets messages. It checks if it's in, uh, between these limits. And if it is, it'll allow the message. If it's outside of this limit, it'll uh, block the message and you'll be safe. So to circle back to the beginning of our talk, um, how can something like Coma uh, exist? I think it boils down to three different points. So first, more car the cars are more similar than they look at first glance. So we know with all the, the OBD2 stuff that they all ended up using Canvas, except for a few German brands which use Flexway, but whatever. Um, so they're all using Canvas. Uh, they all have the same generic setup with the radar connected to the camera and then the camera sending messages to the rest of the car. That's very nice. They're all accessible from the cabin. Uh, so it's very easy to build the hardware. Then the second point is that most of the code base, code base is very generic. So you saw that, for example, Controls D, which should be the one generating the messages, is uh, even mostly um, car independent. So all the planner stuff, all the control stuff is very car independent. And then finally, um, the hardware difference is also abstracted away with the car harness. So most of our, har our, har most of our hardware system is very generic uh, with only the car uh, harness connector being the, the part that really differentiates them. 
Thank you. Is there any questions? Yeah, so I'm not sure if everybody heard the question, but the question is, uh, do we run into issues with uh, OEMs, OEM systems detecting that we are sending the messages instead, instead of the car itself? Yeah, because you're tapping into uh, the Android connection as opposed yes. to the Yes. No, this, this, this doesn't really happen. Uh, because for one, we just cut the CAN bus in half. Uh, we have all these messages, and the Panda uh, forwards every message that comes through which we don't care about. So if there's something with like button states or something, it just passes it through and the car doesn't even know it was there. Um, then second of all, we use the same structure that the ADA system uses itself. Uh, so we just replace the control messages it would send so the car doesn't really know who is sending the messages, like if it's either the ADA system or if it's open pilot. So it completely mimics the, the internal car system. Yes. So the question is about Tesla. Uh, actually, I own a Tesla myself. Um, so that's probably why it's one of the carports. Uh, um, so I have an AP2 Tesla. Um, there's uh, the, the autopilot module, which is behind the glove box. It also has this one connector, which goes to the radar and to the car. Uh, so we also built a harness for that. So I'm intercepting that, and I'm sending messages as if I was uh, the autopilot system. Now, there's also the people who uh, have very early Teslas, which don't have the, the AP system, so th which don't have autopilot. Uh, so those are, are also pretty big in our community with uh, adding open pilot to, to their car. So how do those two compare since you have such a significant difference? It's, I think open pilot is a lot nicer, on the highway at least. Um, I don't have uh, longitudinal control on my Tesla yet. Uh, so Tesla still doing gas and brakes, so I still have all the ghost braking issues that Tesla deals with. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the longitudinal is, uh, the lateral control is really nice from open pilot. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, first, thanks for the presentation. It was really great. Thank you. Um, how do you come up with the values, like the 0 0.3 for deceleration? Like, is there any better way to do it besides just following each other around and brake checking each other until? Yes, there, there is like actually a better way. So. Uh, there's this body called uh, ISO, uh, which enforces these limits on uh, car manufacturers themselves. So they publish all these specs, all these standards, which say like, okay, to, ha to have a safe ADAS system, a safe AC system, you need to be between these limits. So we looked at those limits and we actually enforced those. I think on some uh, of our actuator values, we're even like slightly below the ISO limits. Uh, so this, just from, uh, from testing ourselves, we found that we find out these limits uh, to be very safe. Um, so the question was how are the claims about safety validated? Uh, well, the Panda safety is this uh, uh, part of the C code, which is very generic. So it, has, uh, um, it doesn't have a lot of interface with the rest of the Panda code. So we actually built this into a, a shared library uh, ourselves. And then every time this changes, it runs through automated uh, CI tests. So we uh, actually try to break it. Uh, so we have all these unit tests on the code, which tests every limit it enforces and make sure that, uh, that these limits are always, uh, always um, enforced. Also, we try to uh, be, be uh, implementing the ISO 26262 standard, which is also one of the, one of the C uh, safety uh, definitions, uh, which is, I mean, it's just good practice if you're writing any of these codes. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask about that um, ISO 26262 and if you need to be certified to it. And uh, how are you reaching that uh, through software testing or, uh, and, and the hardware? Um, well, some of this uh, just comes down to static code analysis. So for this, we also have automated tools to test this. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it's, um, it's still a level two system. So. Um, we need to ensure that this uh, code doesn't mess up, which we do with our automated tests. And other than that, uh, we also still have the limits, which are usually present in the ECUs of the cars. 
So if you send a torque limit that, or a, a torque value that's too high in, for example, a Honda car, it won't even accept that message. So even on top of that, there's the ECU safety, which is in the, the car itself. Mm -hmm. So also, uh, ISO is a standard, not a regulation. Uh, so there's no certification body. You self-certify that you comply with that. How did you yeah. also look for MIS receipt? Oh, MIS receipt, yeah. That was the name I was looking for. So, so okay, so Mr. you're using MIS receipt and not auto yes. C++ or? We're using CP, uh, CPP check to uh, check all the MISRA regulations, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, how do you get like the, ra can you get radar data from the blind spot monitoring, the two radars on the back of the car? Yeah, so on, uh, that depends on the car. So on some cars, uh, the blind spot radars are actually available from the, the powertrain CAN bus. On some cars, they aren't. But also on a lot of cars, we see that they don't actually output any radar points. Um, so they actually only output like if there's a car in the blind spot or not, so it's only one bit, so it's not extremely useful. Um, we still use it though for uh, our lane change stuff, so we check that there's no car there if we have the data. Um, but we're also working on trying to get more data out of the blind spot radars because they seem very interesting for uh, the future of Comma. Thanks for the presentation. The uh, car harness, is it, um, will it, have ability to accept more cameras in the future, or I know George is uh, all about the one camera because it's you know the well, potential is not fulfilled. But going forward, we we don't actually use the camera images coming from the ADAS camera because it doesn't actually send that data out over the canvas. Uh, so we use our own internal camera in our open pilot device, uh, so the Comma Two, which we now sell, which has one camera, and uh, for most stuff we do, that should be enough. Um, could you maybe speak to your hardware fail safes if there's like a catastrophic failure in the comma system that reconnects the CAN bus and the car is able to, Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it like a, an analog sort of thing on the board? It, it is uh, it's implemented in hardware, yes. So we have this relay which is powered by the Panda. So the Panda says, okay, I want to be in control, which then uh, actually is a relay splitting the buses apart and then actually starts forwarding the messages. Now, this can fail in two ways. So either the relay stays uh, uh, closed which is very easy to detect. So you just see like if a message still went through which you didn't expect to go through. Uh, and another way it can fail is that it uh, stays open and then the card just will fault because it doesn't see all the messages because we're not sending everything. And OEM cards tend to fall in the safe way, yes. Yeah. Anyone else with a question? Uh, my question is also in regard to the range limits. Um, do you always know that if it's out of range that you can safely throw it away or would you consider limiting it? And um, second one is if it's like on the lower end of the range and the higher end of the range, mm -hmm. is that also kind of something you consider when executing those messages? Uh, yes, so a lot of these limits in the safety code are actually based on speed as well. Um, so torque limits are based on speed. Um, second, uh, if we drop a message, like this, in practice, this shouldn't really happen. Like th this only happens if an open pilot code uh, messes up or if it does a bug. Because in the open pilot code, we also tend to uh, want to stay within those limits. So usually we stay in those limits and everything's fine. Uh, if we do go outside of these limits uh, and this would pose a safety issue, then we would just block the message and uh, go on with our day. If this continues for a long time uh, and a lot of these messages get dropped, then the car will start complaining because it does expect a certain, uh, a certain frequency of these messages. Great, I've got a question back here. So I think I have a question about hardware and OEMs potentially in the future locking out foreign parts. And the reason why I have this thought is because I saw videos on like the right to repair and how different companies make it hard to repair their software without, you know, their signed specific hardware. And I was wondering, is this something Com is going to consider in the future where it's not a problem now, but OEMs might make it so that only certain pieces of hardware can communicate with their systems to control the car? Uh, yes, so well, first of all, we tend to use the same message structure as the internal components itself. So as long as there's not any signing going on, the car doesn't even know the difference between their own internal modules and uh, what we are sending. Uh, second of all, there has been some uh, very recent car implementations which do use the signing and that's, that's something we're, uh, we're working on. Uh, all right, um, so I just have a question. I think it's similar to what was asked before, but rather than dropping the package, 
would it be better to just clamp it to the maximum value that uh, the limit you enforce? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, we don't do this because we don't want the panda safety code to actually start generating messages. Uh, so the panda safety code is designed from the bottom up to only be able to read messages and block them. Um, if we don't do this, if we actually allow the panda to generate messages, uh, this will make the system very hard to reason about. So you'll have open pilot, which we lock, then sending a message and the car reacting differently than what we expect. Uh, so we've, we just drop the message and then we know this is very easy to reason about and we know what the car will actually do. Now in practice, this doesn't really happen because open pilot is pretty good at keeping it between the limits. Great, and we're sending a mic upstairs so you guys can, we can hear you. Um, does anyone else have a question down here? Did you guys ever, or do you plan to maybe modify the firmware on any existing car modules? Let's say if you need to get around some limit that's arbitrarily too low or too high on the OEM side. This is something that's been uh, going around in the community a little bit. Uh, we don't actively endorse this or support this. Um, but there is some people who have figured out how to alter these limits, uh, especially on the Honda cars, which have a pretty low steering limit. Um, um, so yeah, we do block these users if they if they change them to to unsafe values. Though. <laughs> hey, thanks again for great presentation. Um, one note: um, it would be nice if you guys put it uh, into some kind of um, document, like explaining uh, uh, architecture and all that, because it's very useful for somebody starting. Another thing uh, I wanted to ask. Um, with the cars, for the cars with the weird uh, arrangement like Hyundai, they have radar connected uh, to different places. What, what is Coma planning to do about it? Um, well, some of the cars have a slightly different topology. Uh, so I know on one of the cars, for example, the ADAS camera sends to the radar and then the radar forwards it to the, to the rest of the car. Uh, usually we do find a way to tap into those cars as well though. Um, sometimes, um, we just tap it off of the camera and only control the lateral part of the steering. So we just control steering and not gas and brakes, um, which is, a, is an easy workaround. But there's also other harnesses floating around which actually do uh, pull it off on a, uh, actually uh, split the bus at a different point, which makes us control the rest of the car. Great, got a question down here. Um, given that most of our cars are only designed to keep ourselves within the lane and we're extending that to you know, more active uh, use of the steering motors. Mm -hmm. Have you done any research into if that shortens the lifespan of our steering motors, what the implications might be there? Um, well, I think we can say pretty certainly that this doesn't because these motors, they're not actually meant to provide the ADAS system, so not for link keep assist, but they're actually there to provide power steering. So they actually uh, put so much torque on the wheel when you're like just flinging the wheel around yourself, they actually put way more torque on the wheel than we would uh, just driving it through the ADAS messages. So this wouldn't be, uh, this wouldn't hit any hardware limitations at all. For the DBCs you guys reverse engineer, do the companies care? Do they say anything, provide you guys feedback? I'm not sure if we ever got any feedback on it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they don't really, they don't probably even know it exists. So. <laughs> Um, out of curiosity, how does CAN FD affect things? Is that something that you guys need to consider? And what are your thoughts on it? Oh, CAN FD. That's, uh, I think we're going to talk about that a little more today. So I'm not going to say too much. So um, when you connect a device like Carista to your OBD, um, and you can unlock some features like cracking the windows from your key, mm -hmm. do you have any messages like that? that you can use? It's not really related to self-driving, but maybe you can detect that the car is getting hot or something and then just crack the windows? Well, yes. I mean, we have access to the CAN bus, so we can send any, uh, any message we'd like. Um, this is not something we'll support uh, officially, of course, but if people are running forks, uh, so modified versions of OpenPilot, like, they can certainly uh, implement this stuff. Great. Do we have any more questions down here? Is there any plans for weather related or, or road condition, uh, you know, speed limits or checks, say uh, freezing cold uh, mountain pass and uh, you got to limit the uh, torque a bit? 
yeah. so that your safety uh, increases. No, I, I think this is more of a question for the for the next speaker or research uh, research hat because um, this is more uh, an open pilot question. There's not be any any low level implementation needed there. So we hear a lot about Tesla over the air updates. Mm -hmm. Do they go deep enough that they would interfere with you? Uh, would they be able to um, break your connection uh, and break your control over the car with an over the air update? I don't think so. Um, no, I mean we're just tapping off the the, ADA, the bus. Um, they don't even know we're there. So. Are there any um, are there any concerns with manufacturers like forking Open Pilot and creating their own? version of it in some way? Or like, are they concerned with you guys at all? Do you have any comments on that? Uh, I don't know if they're concerned or not, but uh, I mean, it's an open source project, it's MIT licensed, so they're free to do whatever they want with it. Okay, so is there another question over here? Sorry, could you quickly speak to what kind of hardware you use? Are you mostly microcontroller based? Do you have FPGAs on board? And mm -hmm. what kind of latency throughput problems do you have between sending and receiving messages to like the core open pilot back into the system? Um, I can't really come up with a number about the total latency, uh, but we do run all of our stuff at 100 hertz, and that seems to be more than fast enough uh, to get the throughput we need. Um, Canon is also not uh, a time triggered uh, system, so if the message comes a little bit later, like nobody cares about this. Um, as far as which kind of hardware we use, um, on the Panda it's mainly an STM32 F4 microcontroller, uh, which runs all the, the low-level embedded real-time stuff. Uh, and then on the hardware side, we have uh, a, uh, a phone which runs all the, the open pilot codes, basically. There are several features that use OBD ports, like some of the insurance companies now have dongles, and T-Mobile has a dongle. Mm -hmm. Have you had, had any thoughts about integrating with such things or ways to make them work? Do I have to pull my comma if I want to get a better insurance rate? <laughs> um, we don't work with these kind of companies. Uh, we're a pretty small team. So this, this, these are all features that are not really that related to self-driving. Uh, so I don't think we will spend much time in uh, integrating this. But as I said, like it's an open source project. So if anybody wants to make these modifications, they're more than welcome, welcome to. Are there any other evolutionary changes that you guys are thinking about, like car-to-car -car communication or anything else? Uh, there's some stuff going on, as uh, alluded by one of the questions. So CanFD is an, is an upcoming standard, which basically uh, uh, makes sure that the CAN bus can handle a lot more data throughput. Uh, and this is also something we're, uh, we're looking into. Great. Do we have any other questions down here? Thank you. So, uh, so for conversion cars, you guys put it like a sending message to uh, VCU first, and VCU is going to send the talk command to the uh, engine. But like for e cars, the Panda probably can do uh, it's can it, it can directly send the talk command to uh, inverter. Have you guys tried that? Uh, you mean how do we send the commands to the inverter of an electric car? Yeah, for e cars, you can use Panda directly send the Tor command to invert oh, and can. kind of bypass the uh, ECU. So. Now, fundamentally, these systems aren't very different. So they still uh, there's still an ACC system which is very similar to uh, non-electric cars, and they also still send the command which says like, okay, I want this amount of acceleration or braking, and the inverter will handle this exactly the same way as uh, a regular uh, fossil fuel car would. Great. If we don't have, oh, we got some more questions down here. <laughs> a lot of questions. Is there any worry as more cars have over-the-air updates that they could roll out something like the RAV4 Prime encrypted CAN bus where you could have a vehicle that works and then over the air that encryption is rolled out or is that too low level to worry about that in the future? I, I wouldn't be worried about that. If you have a car right now which uh, doesn't have any encryption going on, um, they're not going to be able to do this over the air. Like most of these cars don't even have over the air updates. Um, I think Tesla is the only big manufacturer which really has that at the moment. Um, but also this, this encryption stuff usually requires uh, a more advanced microcontroller than all of the ECUs. So they can't just upgrade that over the air. So I wouldn't be too worried. Hey, um, can you also elaborate a little bit on the next version of uh, hardware? 
what is what is in the to-do list, like what you guys are working for. I'm sorry, I didn't fully understand. <coughs> like uh, next version of the hardware, what uh, what is the uh, what, what is in? Uh, I mean, what's in, in the, the pipeline hardware-wise? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not uh, just high so level. It's not my point to talk about today. <laughs> Have you considered building like a flash utility in the open pilot so you can actually do updates at the EC level, like true OTA updates, like for your car's controllers? Well, no, because for once, uh, for one part, we don't really want to do EC up, ECU updates. Uh, this touches a lot of the safety stuff, which is internal to the car. Uh, and second of all, we don't really need to do this. Like most cars have a pretty good interface as it is. So. This, this is pretty complex, and we wouldn't want to support all the different cars, obviously. Great, if that's it, I will thank you so much, Roba. Thank you.